Next Level Ministry Workshop. We had a wonderful fellowship on last night, meeting our facilitators. We come this morning to, to gain wisdom, to gain insight. We have a very capable facilitator.
we have the space to do uh, many things right now. Uh, of course, you, you want to grow, and, and as you grow, you need more capacity in, in terms of building the space. But right now, you're you're not you're not you're not tied in by having a small uh, sanctuary, a fellowship hall, classroom space, which I see in other places. You don't have that issue. But the most uh, exciting thing that I've experienced since I've been here is you have the human capital. You have, Pastor has inherited a church with some absolutely awesome people, intelligent people. Uh, man, if, if I had, in 1995 when I came to Wayne, if I had what Pastor Williams has walking in the door and what I told man, you got, you, you got to set up for success. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I know about this is, is who has pastored here. Oh, since since um, your former pastor, my presiding elder, since presiding elder kid was here on down the line. And, 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 and the way I want to frame this is I want you to, to consider former pastor, now presiding elder kid, as being your Moses. He was your, he was your Moses. He, he was the only person. And God's plan for this ministry that could take you from where you were before he came to where you were when he left. Now, uh, Pastor Williams is your Joshua. Amen. And so now it's time to go to the next level. And so I want to talk to you this morning about casting the vision for next level ministry. And your pastor said something that was really key. It's almost as if uh, he's, he's in my brain. I want you to really begin to think outside of a box. Don't spend all your mental capacity focusing on what is, what was, but really begin to ask yourself questions. What can this ministry really be? Again, to go back to something I said last night, which I, I, I live by, the number of scriptures that, that, that really uh, keep me motivated. And one of them is this. That the Bible says that God is no respecter of person. Now, as a pastor, what that means to me is if he is no respecter of persons, that means he's also no respecter of pastors. Mm -hmm. Which tells me, which informs me that God can do just as much in my ministry as he's done in anybody else. He doesn't love a T.D. Jakes any more than he loves a Mark Christmas. He doesn't love a potter's house any more than he loves a mile out. So, so the, the issue or the question is not God. It's are we ready to really uh, take our foot off the brake and let God really be God in the life of the church. And in order to do that, we have to cast the vision. Now, the, the, the importance of vision, Proverbs 29, 18, familiar passage of scripture, where there is no vision. The people care. The people die. The people can't go to the next level. Now, when you really uh, study that that one verse of scripture, you will find that that word vision. This is the King James version. You will find the word vision simply means the revelation of God. So, where there is no revelation of God, the people perish. And so, what vision really is, even though as as as, as, as pastors and leaders we talk about our vision, but the reality of it is. The vision always belongs to God. It's always about what, what does God want out of my life? What does God want out of our local church? What does God want out of the church at large? It is not, it is not Pastor Griffin's vision. It is God's vision for Wayman Ministries. How, 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 how does God want to manifest himself at 600 Jones Street. That is right, Jones Street. <laughs> so, 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 regardless of how he may be manifesting himself anywhere else, the question comes, what does God want to do right here? Okay, and until we really get that, that picture, <coughs> we're really trying to really discover and uncover what God has placed us here for. Then there's got to be more than coming to church, singing, praying, <coughs> preaching, taking up an offering, Picking up worship bulletins, vacuuming, turning off the lights, paying the bills. God's got to want more than that. Amen. So the question becomes, what, what is that? Now, also, not only does the vision affordable, but in it, vision gives energy. Vision gives drive. 
And the Lord answered and come back to us. And he asked me and said, write your vision. Make it plain upon the table. And he made what? Run. So, so when, when, when we understand the vision and when we, when we publish the vision, the people are able to run. That, 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 that's a verb. And I, I, I remember from my, my education. That's a verb is what? An action verb. Okay. And so it's, it's my job as, as a leader of my ministry, uh, once I understand the revelation of God in my local church, I've got to make sure that everyone understands it. It starts with the pastor, it goes to the leaders, and then it spreads out to the general membership of the church. They can't run with what they don't know. So, so as, as pastors and leaders, we've got to go through a process of, of casting the vision, understanding for ourselves as best as we can with our finite brains. What is it that God really wants out of this church? And we know it more than just having church. He doesn't really need another church. Amen. Amen. There's enough replication and duplication of that. And so, so in order for the people to become energized, and I heard my brother over here last night, he asked that question about uh, ministries and leaders and, and how do we get more people. We got to energize them. People have to be, they have to be, they have to be motivated, they have to be touched, they have to be, um, to some extent, they have to be excited about ministry. Okay? Because see, what, what we find is uh, people will get excited on Sundays at 1 o'clock mm -hmm. because that's kickoff time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to figure out a way to get that same excitement two or three hours earlier. <laughs> so, so, and it comes with having that vision. <coughs> now, the importance, the energy, now, the necessity of this, every church needs a clear vision. Every church needs a clear vision. Unfortunately, I, I think it, 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 it totally you can agree with these first statements. Even though every church needs a clear vision, most churches lack vision. We, we know we, we know what we do. We know we know the mechanics of having church. Uh, we know how the church is organized. We know the boards. We know the auxiliaries. We know where crowd number one sings. We know where crowd number two has rehearsal. We know where to wear our, our white tops and our black bottoms. Okay. We know order. We know when to stand. We know when to sit. We know when we can go out to the sanctuary. We know when to sit down. We got that, but we don't have vision. So most churches have, have real processes that they go through, but they really don't lack vision even though the church needs a vision. And then most do not understand what vision really is. And again, we, I just mentioned that. Vision is really the revelation of God. What does God, what does God, what does God want out of you? What does God want out of us? So every church needs to be Most churches lack it. And it's because they don't understand it. And it's simply a picture of what God wants to follow you. Now, when you understand that vision is simply a picture of what God wants to do, you will stop asking God to bless what we're doing. And you'll start asking God to show us what to do. Show us to do what you're blessing. Now this is not can't take credit. Rick Warren, Perfect Human Church. Amen. So we, we normally say, God, bless our program. But God might not be doing that program anymore. <laughs> that program went out with grandma two, two, two generations ago. And we're still trying to bless God. You asking God to bless, but God, God left that long time ago. So we have to understand it's not saying God bless what we're doing, but it's saying God help us to do what you're blessed. That, that's where um, really observing and studying successful ministries become very important. Not just iron sharpening iron. Okay. So you've got to find some other iron if you want your iron to become sharp. Okay. And, and again, we have to get we got to get out of this mindset of we you don't want to copy off them. It's not about copying off of them. It's about understanding that God the Bible says before I do a new thing. Okay. And so I've got I've got to figure out in, in my ministry, man, exactly what is God? And guess what? Once I figure out what he's doing now, I have to be prepared.
prepared for the fact that maybe five, ten years down the road, he's doing something at least slightly different than he was doing five, ten years ago. And we're going to talk about change in a moment. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a dangerous word in a church. <laughs> it's change. But you got to understand, God is moving. See, the, the people of Israel, the, the Bible says God moved them. You know, he, he, he moved them by day with a, with a cloud. Yes. And he moved them by night high, pillar of fire. In other words, God was saying, I'm moving. Yeah. So I'm going to leave you a cloud in the day. I'm going to give you fire at night. Now, if you miss the cloud, if you miss the fire, you're going to miss me. Because where I am now, that's not where I'm going to be tomorrow. Me and our churches are still today where they were yesterday. And they're wondering why God is not there. It's crazy. He left. He left. He left. Okay. And so we really have to ask this question. God, help me to see what you're doing. In his book, Rick Warren, he gives a great illustration. Of, uh, he's a pastor of uh, Saddleback Community Church, which is out in California. And of course, California is a big serving area. And in the book, he talks about something that, 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 that really struck me, even though I'm, I'm not a surf, I have no desire to be on the surf. But, you know, no. but he says, a good surfer understands as, as, as expensive as a surfboard may be, as well trained of a surfer as he or she may be. One thing that the surfer cannot do, and that is the surfer cannot create a wave. Amen. Think about that. You'd be the greatest surfer in the world, but, but if, if the ocean is flat, you can never surf. So what you have to do as a surfer, you have to be prepared so when God sends the waves, you have to learn how to catch that wave. One of the things our churches are not doing, we are not, we're not, we're not understanding the importance of being prepared to catch that wave and just ride that bad boy out. When that wave ends, you have to get ready for the next wave. Okay. And so the, the necessity of vision, it, it really causes us to ask our God, help us to see what you're blessed. You bless what you're blessed. Now, he talks about things that really hinder God. What 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 is it about uh, these are influences that tend to drive churches? which in most cases uh, are not what God wants us to do. Uh, one of the things that drives church is tradition. Okay, can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. Okay, uh, uh, Tradition-driven churches uh, have a more difficult time really embracing what God is doing. I didn't say an impossible time, but a more difficult time. See, our, our problem is that Scripture talks about the fact that we can't go forth because we, we, we hold on to, uh, well, let me put it this way. We don't understand the, the purpose of tradition. We should not, we should not abandon. Man, that was your fault, not mine. <laughs> Good thing it wasn't tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. <laughs> We should not dis discard vision. We shouldn't throw we, I mean, tradition. We shouldn't throw tradition away. But we have to understand the place of tradition. Let me give you let me give you this example I use all of because I think it really it really paints the picture. As as a as a church of tremendous history and legacy and past, you don't ever want to get away from that. You want to make sure your children and your grandchildren understand how my olive became the church it is. Okay. I understand that as the pastor of William Chapel, there were pastors that came before me that helped pave the way okay, for me to be where I am now. And so I don't I don't I don't dishonor that. I don't discount that. I don't come on the scene and say nothing ever happened before I got there. Okay. But at the same time I understand I have to keep tradition and history and legacy in its proper place. It's like driving a car down the road. Okay. A church of, 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 of my knowledge that has history and legacy and, and, and all kind of tradition, that's your rear view mirror. Okay. But in, in addition to having a rear view mirror, you have your future. That's your windshield. Okay. So as you're driving down the road, you have your windshield that guides where you're going. You have your rearview mirror that shows you where you've been. Okay. 
Good drivers know that you primarily look out the front windshield, but every now and then, through your side view mirror, you glance behind. You look forward, you glance back. You look forward, but you glance back. Okay, now, new churches that just spring up overnight on a storefront one day, and then five years later, they got all your numbers. Y'all seen churches like that? <laughs> Those churches, because they're new, they have no back window. They have no rear. So all they have is windshield. What drives those new ministries is the fact that they are 100% forward thinking, forward looking. They have no history. They have no legacy. They have no shoulders to stand on. The only direction they can look in is forward. So that forward look is what propels them to become next level ministries almost overnight. Okay. Now, the challenge for a mile, the challenge for traditional churches, the challenge for most heavy churches is to understand that we don't have to give up the rear view mirror, but our primary focus has to be looking forward and glancing back. But most traditional churches that are, that are driven by their tradition, they glance forward and they stare back. <laughs> <laughs> they spend an inordinate amount of time talking about where we used to be and how poor the church used to be and how great a pastor he used to be. You want to glance. You don't want to stare. What will happen to you if you get in your car right now and if you glance backwards? Why are you trying to drive this? You're going to, you're going to have a wreck. And that's the problem with many of our tradition-driven churches. They are literally wrecks. Another influence that tends to drive churches is personality-driven churches. Those are churches that will only survive as long as the current leader is the leader. Big challenge. Big challenge. Uh, and, and we see a lot of those churches. And we see when uh, you, you take uh, New Destiny in Orlando, Zach 10. Yeah. 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 Completely driven by his personality. Now they're, they have all kind of issues. But still don't understand how to deal with it. Because that's all that works out. Personality driven church is a church that, that, that will do well as long as that personality is in place. And even in itinerant ministries such as ours, uh, if you've got a lot of change in the pulpit, that personality will not necessarily be the path. It could be a, a strong lay leader. I mentioned to somebody this morning before we were having breakfast. I came to Wayne and I was the eighth pastor that the church had had in the last 10 years. So no wonder the church was not growing. And I, 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 I remember... I won't call the name of the person, but I remember the personality that, that drove the church because the pastor, you don't, you know, it, it takes you, pastor, it takes you some years before you really, you know, you got the paper, but it, you, it, it takes a while to get the reins. And when I got to this church, I, I never get, when I got to one, we, we had a, a process where we were talking about vision and five-year plan and, and this, this key personality uh, that used to chew pastors up and spit them out. <laughs> He came to me after that session. He said, Real, you talking about a five year plan? You ain't going to be here. <laughs> 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 I told him, I mean, I, he, he, that's one thing I want to give him credit for. He did do it on the side, one on one. <laughs> I said, Brother, I'll be here when you go. Oh. <laughs> now. And I think I married him about 10 years ago. <laughs> Because I knew what God was saying. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a competition or contest between he and I. But I knew that if he, if he stands in the way of what God was doing, God would do it. So, so we're in the process. I'm talking about this we're, 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 we're working on uh, make sure that even at Wayman, it's not so driven by my personality that if, if, if I went away or something happened to me, that everything would collapse. Another thing that drives churches is finance. Finance driven churches. Those are churches that, when, when, when ministry opportunities are presented, the overriding question and the overriding concern is, how much is that going to cost? <laughs> now, we always need to count the cost. But when you get to the point where how much it costs drives the decision and you say no simply because you think it's going to cost a lot of money, you're not giving God the opportunity to provide the finance for the ministry. Amen. Where there is vision, God will always make provision. <laughs> You, you, you don't ever know that person sitting in the pew or that person who may not even be a member of the church.
church, when they find out that the vision is going forward, there are people out there who will say, you know, I've, I've been waiting on somebody to start that ministry. I've been waiting on somebody to set the area. And they, they will go in, into their and, and sometimes you, say, you don't even think I'm like, it doesn't have to be a steward or, or a leader. It could be some quiet soul that says, you know, I've been waiting. I've just been waiting on someone. And, and so we have to make sure that we're not so finance driven that, that the, 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 the price tag, and it costs money to do ministry, please understand, but that we don't, we're not so driven by how much it may cost that we say no before we give God an opportunity to make a way. Program driven churches are also uh, the type that, that tend to drive away the revelation of God. And in and, and this definition, these are, these are churches that have certain programs in place that, that really drive the, the, the reputation. For instance, if you've got a great music program, or if you've got a great youth program, that's, that's good in and of itself. But in many cases, I see churches that, that might have a great music program, but there are too many other things that are lousy. Okay. And so uh, a church that is program driven will rest on the fact that we have this one good program. So we're, as long as our choir sings well, we don't, we don't need to worry about teaching. Okay. No, no, you have to have a balanced ministry because, because music might draw some. Youth and children ministry might draw somebody else. Seniors ministry might draw somebody else. So there has to be a balance. One of the things we found out in our church as we were growing, um, young adults would come, come. And one of the threats that we had to this, this growth of, of young adults was our seniors. Yeah. The people who had been there, who were there when it wasn't popular to be a member of this church. And all of a sudden, we got this influx, a lot of corporate relocation, people not from Jacksonville. They're coming in, and now they're the steward. I used to, I've been on the steward board for 15 years. Now, Pastor gave that young person. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I had to have enough sense to understand that that was a threat because we were losing balance. And so what we, what we did, we really Im implemented a very strong uh, seniors ministry. We call them the wisdom warriors. And, and these are the people who were there when it wasn't so involved to be a member of the church. And, and, and my busy schedule, we, we set aside one Wednesday, the first Wednesday, and every month we have a wonderful Wednesday where we, the seniors come to church and they have lunch with the pastor. And sometimes I'll do a Bible study, sometimes we just, we just sit around the table and, and talk. And we just took them recently to uh, the Holy Land in, in, in Orlando. And then the other thing that we did, which was one of the most powerful things that we've done for our, for our wisdom warrior ministry, we took these young corporate people who were relocated to Jacksonville and joined the church who were from you know, Mississippi, Georgia, wherever. They, they left their families and moved to Jackson. And, and we had them to adopt our seniors. Because what was happening, uh, quite frankly, there was, a, there was a, a growing divide in the church. We had a, we had a generation thing going. You all can use it. And so what we ended up doing, uh, we took, like for us, I, I, I can remember one family, the Barnes family. Husband was in banking. Wife was at the school system. They had two little kids. They had, they had moved uh, from somewhere else, and they were they adopted the Jenkins brother and sister Jenkins. They were both in that night. Brother Jenkins gone home to be with Lord and sister Jenkins. They still live, but, but they, they made, the, the Barnes family became the Jenkins kids. Because in this particular example, the Jenkins didn't have. They never had kids. They were both in that night. God just didn't bless them with children at all. And then we had other. Um, seniors who had kids, but they had grown up, gone to college, and moved out of Chesterfield, so now they have no, no children. So when we start doing this adoption thing, um, um, some of our mothers of the church who hadn't cooked a Sunday meal in years because there was nobody for them to cook for, them. all of a sudden they started turning on the stoves and other things, <laughs> pulling out pots and pans because they have adopted children and they have adopted grandchildren are coming over after church for dinner. And so now it, it was not it was not these young people wanting to do the these young people want to have it. It was like, no, these are my children. And if my children want to have a ministry that relates to them, we're gonna let our children <laughs> sing. So we get that brought together. So the point is sometimes in churches when we're so programmed driven by one or two programs, we, we we forget that there has to be balance. There has to be something for everybody in the church. Building-driven churches, okay? The churches that, that and I pray God, you and I, the 
but there are some churches that get so caught up in, in having a tithe for all, mm -hmm. and they build more than they can afford. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole focus is on meeting the mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's not perfect for God. Mm -hmm. Event-driven churches. These are churches that believe the way you keep people involved is keeping them busy. There's an afternoon, there's a Sunday afternoon program every Sunday. I was a member of the church in Houston, uh, St. Paul Amy Church in Houston. And uh, I was the uh, assistant minister of youth. And every Sunday afternoon, they were having a program. And so whenever you got a program, the choir got to say, and I'm a football fanatic, don't get me wrong. <laughs> and it used to drive me crazy because it goes back to what I heard somebody say, you got these afternoon programs and there's a handful of people. And you know, choir number one anniversary, choir number two anniversary, students board number one anniversary, students board number two anniversary, Russian <laughs> anniversary, trusty anniversary, YPD anniversary, anniversary, uh, anniversary, anniversary, WMS anniversary. <laughs> and almost every Sunday afternoon, you got something going on. You know, it's just event, you, you got to really, really look at that and, and say, is this really effective? And what will happen is, see, <laughs> What you have to do. So you can't eliminate some people's anniversaries <laughs> without eliminating other people's anniversaries. <laughs> so all we do now, we, we do we do church anniversaries. That's the only anniversary we don't do any other anniversary. Okay. If you if you're a steward, you're part of the church. <laughs> so when it's a church anniversary, it's almost a steward. 